Okay. Um, this is CS4510. I think it's 4 1. So, what we're going to cover today is the pumping lemma for context free languages. So, first, let me give you an overview, an idea of uh, what the proof entails. You know, if you recall for the pumping lemma for regular languages, we had this sort of internal recursion uh, on the DFA, and that sort of gave us this substring we could repeat. We have a similar idea here, but instead of on the DFA, it's going to be on the uh, on the parse tree. Right, so... Recall a context-free grammar might have rules like A goes to B, C, D, E, or something, right? So I'm going to say let uh, let B equal the max uh, length of the right-hand sign of any uh, production rule. Right. So in this case, there's B twice here, but you can let it go, I'm sure. B here is 4. Right. So what does that mean? Is like if you have a, uh, in your parse tree, if you have a node, it is at most, like maximally, a B airy tree. Right. So each node uh, has at most uh, B children. We can sort of recursively apply that, right? So the start state is going to have, the start non-terminal is going to have it's just itself, right? But then it can have at most B children. So at one level of production, you have at most B, right? So then at two levels of production, you have at most B squared, and so on, right? So uh, if your uh, string uh, S, let's say the length of S is greater than uh, B I, then uh, the parse tree depth uh, for S is, I think we should say this is greater than equal to, is greater than equal to uh, I. Right. So, another thing is that we only have uh, a finite number of non-terminals, right? So we can, there, there's the catch. If you recall last time, I used the pigeonhole principle to get a sort of a repetition in the parse tree of these uh on terminals, I'm going to do the same here. So uh, let uh, the size of the non terminals just be little v. Then, uh, if we apply that, then if uh, s is greater than or equal to uh, b to the v plus one, uh, then our uh, depth is greater than or equal to v plus 1. So why, why do we care about that? Well, let's draw our tree. Uh, by the pigeonhole principle, if there's v variables and our depth is v plus 1, then there's a repetition of a non-terminal symbols, right? So let's suppose t. I'm just going to call it t. t is the repeated variable. So let's say we have uh, s, and then we have like it looks like this and then uh, we have like T here and then like T here is repeated and then I'll, I'll even make it fancy for you All right and then uh, it produces sort of like this right well let me get rid of that no one who cares clean up the diagrams 
So this is the parse tree for some string s, which is longer than uh, b to the v plus 1. So what that means is we can sort of do surgeries on this. If you recall, we could, in the for regular languages, we could take that loop zero or more times or more than any times as we want. But we have a similar loop idea here where we can perform surgery on these parse trees. So uh, instead of repeating t twice here, what I'm going to do is repeat it one time. So I'm going to say let this get let u v x uh, y z be these parts of the string that are produced by the parse tree. So that s is equal to u v x y z, right? Then um, if I were to draw this tree again, I would do like s uh, t, and then I would just do it like this. Right. So what this is is if this is this part produces this is you, this is this part here. So I've sort of sur done some surgery here. I've sort of cut this part of the parse tree and stitched it into here. So what is this? This is just x. Then this is just this part. Then here this is again whatever was produced on the right of s. So this is going to be z. So. Let's do one more surgery just to make just to make this this 110% explicitly clear. I'm going to say s t uh, t and then I'll do it one more time and then I'll do t. So I'll, I'll sort of copy it twice. So this is the first t. Then at the second t, I've copied it, so it's going to look like this. In fact. So what does that look like then? This is going to be, again, this is going to be u. This is going to be v. Then this is also going to be v. And this is going to be x. Uh, this should be y. This is going to be y. And this is going to be z. So basically, if s is equal to u, v, x, y, z, and this is produced by the language, by the grammar, so it's in the L, then also uh, u, v to the i, x, y to the i, z should also be an L uh, for all i. So we pump down here, and here we're pumping up, right? I can increase this uh, parse tree as I keep going. What this is, is it looks almost immediately analogous to the pumping lemma. And if you think that, you would be right. Uh, it's sort of like a dual-wielded, double-handed pumping lemma condition. So this is the idea behind the pumping lemma for context-free languages. Uh, now I'm going to give you the actual statement of the proof and how to use it. Because again, like the real pumping lemma, it is quite confusing to use. So it's better we say explicitly what, uh, explicitly how to use uh, the lemma. Uh, first, step one, assume to the contrary um, that L is a, uh, a context-free language with pumping length P. Here, P is part of the proof. It's not the number of states. P is really uh, like uh, B to the V plus 1. So we have this recurrence here. But for the sake of the proof, we just still say P. right? Who cares about B and V and all this? So, uh, step 2. Choose a really good choice for S and L. 
So just make a, that's probably the hardest step is choosing a good string to, to reach your contradiction as fast as po possible. And uh, S should be greater than P. So again, you can just think of it like you do it for regular languages. You make S a function of P. Like 0 to the P, 1 to the P, something like this, something analogous to this. Three. Uh, for all. All right, this way. For all. Uh, ways. To. Um. Break up. S into U V X Y Z. Uh, such that we have two conditions here. First. Uh. V Y is greater than zero. What that basically means is both can't be empty. You have to like pump something, right? If you're pumping empty strings, then there, there, there's no point. Second, that V X Y is uh, less than or equal to P. And again, what this what this gives us is that we have the sort of repetition uh the vxy if recall if you recall is this tree this sort of uh thing we surgically implant and uh by guaranteeing that's less than p we get the contradiction we get the uh correct number of states excuse me we get the correct uh we we get the the height of it is uh v plus 1 so we get the the duplication uh so for all cases you, you, that uh, s equals u v x y z, uh, choose. I'll say I'll say it this way: there exists i uh, such that u v to the i x y to the i z is uh, not in L. Uh, for all cases. So that's it. That's how to use the uh, pumping lemma for context-free languages. Let's do an example. We haven't actually talked too much about languages which aren't context-free. So you might have some trouble believing some of these are not context-free. Let L equal example. Example one. I'll do like three or four examples. Because uh, pumping is definitely something you learn by repetition and by watching. Let L equal 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, such that n is greater than or equal to 0. Just 0 to the n, 1 to the n is context free. You can make a grammar for it. And we've shown how to make a grammar for it. In fact, it's the classic example of a context-free grammar, which is not regular. The same idea sort of extends here. If you think, if you would imagine about how a grammar might look for this, you would have to like pump the zero and the two and then like keep those the same. But then how would you keep track that the middle ones are exactly the same number, right? So this language is, I claim is not context-free. So let's prove it. I'm going to follow my formula exactly. Uh, one, assume to the contrary, call it L, L is context free with, uh, pumping length P. All right. Again, P is actually B to the V plus one, but. Let's pretend we're not worried about that. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to choose S to be an obvious choice here. I'm going to say 0 to the P, 1 to the P, uh, 2 to the P. That's my choice. Now, previously at other steps, I might have broken this up into uh, multiple substrings with uh, exponents that add up together nicely. But I'll I'll do it I'll do it one time to show why that's really messy when it when you do it like this. So 
again, uh, again, it's got to be u, v, x, y, z. So let's consider the case that both v and y contain some zeros and some ones, and then so v contains some zeros and some ones, and then y contains some ones and some twos. So what that's going to look like is going to look like uh, uh, zero to the p minus a, zero to the a, one to the b. 1 to the p minus b minus c, uh, 1 to the c, uh, 2 to the d, and then 2 to the p minus d, right? If I were to do it this way, and I would say, okay, this is going to be u, this is going to be v, this gets to be x, uh, this gets to be y, and this gets to be z. And then I say, well, at this step, I would say, well, u... Uh, u v squared x y squared z might uh, keep the exponents the same but then they're going to be in the wrong order right if I do v v here it's going to be zeros and then some ones and then some more zeros right so uh, this one this case won't uh, keep the order so now let's consider the case so I could write them out in exponents this way, but that's quite messy. So instead of writing a case like this, I'll say, I'll break it up to, to, to the cases like this. So case one, uh, V and Y contain, uh, I'll write it actually a line lower. Case one, V and Y uh, both contain more than one plus and three uh, types symbols symbols. Why do they contain less than three symbols? Why? By this condition. If VXY is less than or equal to P, then all of VXY is going to be in one unit. Right, or it's overlapping at most two of the sections. It's either all in here or all in here or all in here. Right, it's not going to be spanning all three. Vxy is, is if vxy was uh, con if vxy contained more than three, then if v or excuse me, if v or y contained more three symbols, then it would be greater than length p because it would have to contain all the ones. So that contradicts the fact that vxy is less than equal to p. So let's suppose both v and y contain exactly two types of symbols each. Uh, then u, v squared, x, y squared, z uh, won't be in order. And thus it's not an L. Case two, uh, v, y, uh, only one kind. So I'll say both, V, Y, both one kind of symbol. Well, let's think about the contra well, what the contradiction would be here. If, if, if uh, V is all zeros and uh, Y is all ones or something, then both these, if we pump them, they're going to be greater than the twos, right? So then the three exponents are not balanced. Again, if they're both ones, then the ones are not balanced. If they're both, uh, if if the v is the ones and the y is the twos, then it, again, it's not balanced. Then uh, so we'll say u v squared x y squared z not equal, not equal amounts. It's no longer balanced. So again, it's not an L. So case three, uh, V, Y, one is a one kind of symbol. Uh, other is uh, two. So let's say V is all zeros and Y is zeros and ones, right? Uh, you might be able to, through some very contrived choices, keep the exponents the same, but then again, this is kind of the same as case one, 
where if it contains more than one kind of symbol and you pump y, it's not going to be in order. Again, so u v squared x y squared z is not in order. So then it's not an L. Okay, so that's one example of how to do uh, pumping a context-free language. Some things to note. The cases were less formal here. I didn't break them up into the exponents. So that, if you're you know, a stickler for rigor, this may be a little harder for you. If you like to play fast and loose anyway, this may be great for you. But there is a pattern here that I had to follow. I could, instead of doing this, I could have actually written out all the cases. So what each of these cases, if you could think of them as actual silver subcases. So this could be, uh, this is actually one case where V and Y, this would this case is exactly written out here. But let's say V, Y are both one kind of symbol. That's actually three cases, right? Actually, it's two because the, the second would originate a case. So this would be like... Uh, y oh, all right v y such that this is like uh zero to the a one to the b or this is one to the a two to the b and it couldn't be zero to the a two to the b uh right because v x y is less than or equal to p so that would eliminate the case so this is really these two cases so far are really like three cases and then v and y is one kind and, and one is the other so that's really like two more cases right so V would be like 0 to the A, uh, 1 to the B, and then uh, Y would be like 2 to the C, or uh, V would be like, uh, actually, there's probably, there's probably more cases here. I don't care. It's, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. It's easier if you can take a, a step back and give a bird's eye view of what the cases are going to look like and you immediately follow the contradictions. So. I'm going to do some more examples though, because this is a very tricky thing. And it's easy. It's better to learn by repetition. So let's do like two or three more examples. Let's do uh, a similar problem. Zero to the I, let's say L equals one to the J, uh, two to the K such that I is less than or equal to J, less than or equal to K. This I also claim is context is not context free. Uh, so one assume to the contrary L is context. Uh, free with pumping length p now two uh what's step two we choose a string right so i'm going to choose the same string actually zero to the p one to the p two to the p it'll make things easy right because if i pop any of zero or one up by one then instantly this is not an l so i think that'll make things kind of nice uh three so i'm gonna say this equals s so what are the cases here uh let's say case one uh v y both uh two types Uh, then u v squared x y squared z is uh, not in order and is therefore not an L. Uh, case two, if v comma y are one type, actually let me write it this way: v y are one type each. I'm going to say, okay, well v can be zeros. Y can be ones, V can be ones, Y can be twos, and then they could both be ones. So in each of these, I have a different contradiction. So let's see, if V is zeros uh, and Y is ones and I pump that up, 
I should break this. So let's say uh, uv squared uh, x, y squared, z will have, oh, let me write that clear, more zeros, ones, uh, than twos, right? And so therefore is not an L. If this is true, we have to be careful here because we can uh, increase two and one greater than zero because it's in it remains an L. But actually, here's a trick we can pump down. Don't forget u v to the zero x y to the zero z is equal to u x z so we eliminate some ones and some twos uh, therefore we'll have uh, less ones twos uh, than uh, zeros so it's again it's not an L now if they're both ones I could do even something drastic here. I could do, this is allowed by the way, u v to the p x, y v to the p z. I don't need to do it, but I could do, just to show you, I could do that. Then the number of ones I would have in v would be p times how many, how, whatever the length of v is, right? So, this would have, the ones would be more than the zeros, fine, but then the ones would also be uh, more than the two, so more ones than twos. So it's again, it's not an L. And case three, uh, if v comma y one two to one is one is uh let's say one is one type, one one type, uh, other is two types that means uh, V for example zeros and then Y is ones and twos or V for example is ones and then Y is one and twos or you know there's something like that right something is going on uh, again it, it's still not an order so u v squared X Y squared Z is uh, not in order whichever one uh, has more than two type, which has two types. Again, it's sort of like case one. So, if I were to go back and rewrite this proof, I would go ahead and just say either v or y has more than two types, and then prove that separately, and then prove this case. So I could sort of merge case one, and cases one and three, kind of, right? So again, this is not an L. That covers all possible cases to break it up, and we chose an I for each case. So therefore. By the pumping lemma for context-free languages, this language cannot be regular. Let's do one more example, I think. Okay, I'm going to show you the final cool language uh, that uh, is, is not context-free. So let L equal WW such that W is in sigma star. So it's just any string which is a copy of itself. Now, I could also write this as w1, w2, such that w1, w, w, w2 are in sigma star, and w1 equal w2. Now I'm just going to use w1 and w2 here to refer to which half I talk about. This is actually a really tricky language uh, to pump. If you have like w and then w, and you have your your V here and your Y here, as you pump those, it's possible to keep it as a palindrome, excuse me, as a copy, right? Because you're gonna, if you pump them like the same, they're gonna stay the same. So you have to be careful which strings you choose. There's a, I would stop here and practice and try a couple strings and see which ones you can actually pump. There's many strings in this language which you can pump. Here's one which you can't pump. So first I'm going to assume to the contrary uh, L is a CFL with pumping 
length p. Now the string I'm going to choose is uh, 0 to the p, 1 to the p, 0 to the p, uh, 1 to the p. Now for my cases, clearly by the way s is greater than p. All right. For my cases I could do a lot of messy things here but there's a way to do it which uh, you only have three cases. So case one. So x, uh, so, and we're going to rely on the fact that, uh, recall, we had that vxy was less than or equal to p, and that vy is uh, greater than greater than 0. All right. So case 1, we have 0 to the p, 1 to the p, uh, 0 to the p, 1 to the p. So what that is is that vxy is somewhere in the first half. So vxy uh, is in like this half, right? What what I'll say is this way: uh, v x uh, y is in uh, w one. Okay, suppose it is. Then u v squared x y squared z will sort of increase the strings in w one. So it'll move the midpoint. Uh, into where the old w1 is. So the midpoint is now like here somewhere. Right. So then w1 uh, ends. So if the midpoint is here, we've sort of pushed uh, some zero, some ones into w2. So what that means is w1 uh, starts with zero and w2 starts with one. So therefore w1 does not equal w2, which this whole case implies that it can't be an L. So that's how that works. Case two is actually similar. Uh, we have 0 to the p, uh, 1 to the p, 0 to the p, 1 to the p, and we're going to put uh, vxy in uh, w2 then it's actually almost identical uv squared x y squared z so the midpoint I'm putting in here I'm pumping it up so I'm increasing it then this is going to get longer so the midpoint is going to move to like here so w1 ends in 0 w2 ends in 1 therefore W, w1 does not equal w2. So this can't be an L. So there's one case, and by the way, for both of these cases, I didn't say how they're split into w1 and w2. They could be all ones. They could be zeros and ones. They could be in some whatever way. But I'm doing it this way so I don't have to deal with all those cases specifically. Final case, case three. Suppose that it's in the middle. So we have zero p, 1 to the p, 0 to the p, 1 to the p. So vxy is somewhere in here. Right. It can't be uh, more than this because it's less than equal to p. So suppose it's somewhere in here, right? It can't be both. Uh, so just so suppose it's either all zeros or ones or it's a mix of it. Uh, then we can pump down. So we say u v to the 0 x y to the 0 z which is just uh, uxy excuse me uxz uh, this is going to look like we're not touching these zeros at the front so this is going to look like uh, 0 to the p 1 to the i uh, uh, 0 to the j uh, 1 to the p right so then w1 equals w2 only if i equals j equals p right do you guys see so this this has to equal this and this has to equal this right but 
uh, if i and j were equal to p, uh, but that would imply that uh, vy was empty. I'll say vy was zero, which is not true by this. Right. They both they both can't be p. Maybe one is p, but then the other isn't, and then we again we have an we have an imbalance. So this case brings us not an L. Therefore, it's not an L. This is a very interesting problem. You know, I would take a second and try and find some other strings that you could pump. Uh, ones that would allow you to reach you to a contradiction and ones that wouldn't. For example, I think 0 to the P1, 0 to the P1, uh, you could pump this, I'm sure. So I wouldn't bother with this one. But there are th strings like this which can be pumped. So try and see which strings you can pump. Just try and see which strings you can't. That's what makes this an interesting problem. I think this is sufficient enough for examples for uh, how to pump a context-free language. So, okay. So I'm going to very briefly prove uh, prove uh, closure properties of uh, context-free languages. So they come mechanically from the definition of a grammar. So uh, I'll just uh, I'll just do it in sequence. So uh, union. So let L1, L2 be uh, CFGs, CFLs. So then there exists uh, C, it looks like a G, C, CFGs, uh, G1, G2, uh, with start uh, non terminals. Uh, S1, S2. Then uh, S produces S0, excuse me, S produces S1 or S2 is uh, start non terminal for uh, L1 union L2. Right. We also copy all the rules of the grammars of L1 and L2. So, union. So, uh, regular languages are closed under union. I'm going to go a little faster here. Because it should be obvious what I what I mean by uh, everything else. So, concatenation. Uh, S1, S2. Then our rule goes from S to S1, S2. That's it. That's all I have to do. Uh, what about uh, clean star? It's equally as easy because if you recall, clean star kind of follows from n or zero or more concatenation. So it's really just like uh, uh, s goes to ss or epsilon. So you add that one rule, bam, you have turned your grammar into a clean star. Now, what about intersection? Actually, context-free grammars are not closed under intersection. Surprising result, really. Let me prove it on the next page, actually. It's my room. So, uh, here's an example, right? I think you could probably come up with a few more. Consider the two languages A to the N, B to the N, uh, C to the M. M and N are anything. M comma N are anything. C greater than equal zero. And consider the language uh, A to the M, B to the N, C to the N, such that uh, M again and N are anything. So basically, this there's sort of similar languages. You sort of concatenate it by as many A's as you want, and then you sort of do the uh, BSC thing where you where these two are. Uh, connected. Oh, excuse me. These two are connected, and you can connect with, concatenate with C's, and then these two are, concat uh, are connected, and you concatenate with A's. But the intersection of this language, these two languages, is what? A to the N, B to the N, C to the N, such that N is greater than or equal to zero. Basically, M equals N here for this intersection. And we know this language is not regular. We actually just proved it using 
the uh, pumping lever. So, not closed. Under intersection. Now, what about complement? You may have already had some premonition because I just proved intersection. So we know it's closed under union. So I'm actually, I'll do this proof formally. Uh, suppose to the contrary, CFLs are closed under complement. Let L1, L2 be uh, CFLs. Then L1 complement union L2 complement complement would be a CFL. But this is actually by De Morgan's law is equal to L1 intersect L2. And we know CFLs are not closed under intersection. QED. So let's take a step back and look at some of the things we've proved. We have have this sort of circle here where everything is nice and regular languages. These are all languages which use like a finite amount of memory. Then we have this class of context-free languages, which sort of analogously are languages with one counter max. Every regular language is a context-free language. We did this proof uh, by showing the the regular grammar is always a context-free grammar, but there are uh, context-free languages which are which are not regular, right? So regular is always a subset of C of L, right? Not a excuse me, not a, a not equal subset. So I'll just I'll just write it like that of C of L. So these are two types of computers we sort of discussed. I've discussed actually many equivalent models for regular languages, and they're all they all happen to be less than in power to CFLs to this context-free grammar model. But there are more things. So we're sort of in like a some like Dante's Inferno kind of thing right now, where we're going from these circles of hell into uh, more and more complicated computers. So you can imagine I haven't described a computer yet, which could be bigger or bigger, right? Uh, we're going to get to these. That's sort of, this is just to give you like a, a good visual for what's coming next in the course. I'm going to talk about, actually, we still have some more to talk about with CFLs. I have another, I have, I'm going to give you uh, at least two more things. One is a very powerful theorem involving CFLs. And one is uh, an equivalent model. Uh to CFLs for to excuse me, a model for context free grammars which ends up being equivalent to CFLs, uh, which is not obvious at first either, either. But that's sort of the direction we're going. Eventually, we're going to keep exploring off into this direction of more and more powerful computers, and we'll get to like a sort of final boss of like something that we can't get more powerful to, uh, one that can recognize anything that we care about, and we'll show that that thing has things that even it can't do. This is just a, a sort of a spoiler alert, a sort of a peek, a peek into the future of what's coming.